what up guys, Grand Day, and welcome to a new video inside of Unreal Engine 4. Now, last episode, we got a motion, so we did some motion capture and created some animation for this little scene that we're doing, this little, like, animation capture, like, video thing that we're trying to create. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, so, this episode is actually turning that into a video in a manner of speaking now first things first i just want to just check to make sure but well, i can't remember whether i retargeted it or not because it's not actually showing up here so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you again how to retarget the animation if you want to know how i made the animation and got it into unreal engine so from my mocap software to blender to unreal engine the videos uh, the playlist will be in the description down below with all the videos for this um, particular um, series that I'm doing, but then I'm going to show you how to set up a camera, a setup sequencer, and then set up movie render queue as well as um, sequencer renderer to render out these particular um, this particular video and the different ways in which you can do it. So first things first, though, we need to retarget this animation. Now I did I set up the skeleton properly? Yep, skeleton's all set up. I uh, go into animation base where the animation is. Is it set up in here? Yes, it is. Nice. So, literally, so you've got your animation here, right click, retarget anim assets, duplicate anim assets, here's your skeleton, retarget, bobs your teapot, simple as that, and we should, it should take us straight back to where, in the content folder, where the actual animation is, and there we go, working perfectly fine. So, that's the easy part, right? I'm not saying this isn't easy, it's just a bit finicky at times. So, what you need to do, so, there's two things um, you need to do um, I'm going to get rid of this camera because we don't need it. And also, I've already set up that camera for thumbnail stuff. So, I'm going to get rid of it and make a new one. So, you need to have an animation file, like, in Sequencer. So, you could do that one or two ways. You can either go to Cinematics and you can choose Add Level Sequence. You can click Add Master Sequence, but I just do it Add Level Sequence because that's what I prefer. Um, or what you can do, if you go into your Content Browser, right-click, go into Animation and click Level Sequence. Name it what you want. I'm just going to call it YouTube um, animation, like that. Uh, double click on it, and I'll open up Sequencer. Then what you need to do is you need to go into Cinematic, Cinematic Camera Actor, place it somewhere in your scene. Then you need to go to Track, Actor to Sequencer, click Add Cine Camera Actor 1 or whatever camera it happens to be, and it'll add the camera into your scene. Now, a couple of things, first of all, before we crack on... Um, now, dependent on the type of animation that you want, the video that you want to try and create, your frame rate may alter dependent. So, I always, when I'm doing animation for video, like Traitor or in this particular instance, I'm going to use 24 FPS because that's film based. Now, if you're doing something like a video game cutscene or some, or like a movie that you want to shoot in 60 FPS because you want that smooth video game look about it. Then go for something like 60 or 120. But the problem is with that is that it looks very cutscene and game animation type. There's a couple of other things for it, but that's the reason why I choose 24 FPS. But again, you can choose your frame rate as and when you, as you want. It doesn't really matter. So what you can do first of all. So what, I want to change a couple of my settings it just, just here. So the I'm going to change. So focal length first. It's at 35. Now... If you're doing an inside scene, there's only a certain amount that you can do this with. So essentially, what the focal length does is, if I just go into my... So you click this, and it basically changes the camera so it fills the whole viewport. If you change your focal length, it basically... That's your camera lens size. Now, as far as actual Unreal Engine's physical appearance is concerned, it doesn't actually change anything. What it does is, if I change it to, let's say, 100, it changes the zoom of your camera so the, your the higher your focal length the more zoomed in it is but it makes the quality look different there's a i was there's a good video from william Forcher um where he explains this exactly and looking at the different ways in which the different focal length so he's done he did keyframe focal length whereas keyframe and the different like from like i think it's like from 35 to 115 did that as sort of like an animation and it just goes to show how differently it looks from an outside perspective. But from inside, it doesn't, you, there's only a certain amount you can do it because, especially if you're in an enclosed scene. So if I just um, zoom out of here a minute, let's go to where my character is. That's at 100, right? If I zoom out, 
the camera is quite far away. Now, if let's say you're doing, let's say I was doing some animation in this gunship. If my focal length is set to 100, that is going to be outside of the, that camera is going to be outside of the gunship. But consequently, the, the wall of the actual gunship is going to get in the way as well. So the actual zoom doesn't, it doesn't disregard any objects that's in front of it. So if let's say, um, let's say I changed it to 150. Right, and then I zoomed the camera back out to make it back in line. That's then quite far away, but if there was a wall in between... So let's say I set it to, let's say, 75, and the camera was within the wall, but still you could see the character. If I set it to 150, and then push the camera back so the, ca so the character's back in shot, that wall's going to get in the way, because obviously the camera's behind the wall now. So in an enclosed inside scene, it's a bit difficult, but of an outside scene, if you can... I'd say about 100, about 100, 120 focal length most of the time works well. Again, it's a little bit different here because we've got a nighttime scene, but that's the settings that I use whenever I'm on doing outside environments. Um, then your aperture is essentially your um, how your, how blurry your scene is. So I can change it to 20 and it'll basically get rid of all of the depth of field entirely. Now, I'm going to change that back to 2.8 just to show you the focus distance. Because if you change the aperture, you get no depth of field, right? And the depth of field is the blurriness in the background. So if I go down here and we see focal method, if you check this box, if you then move this downwards, you'll see coming over the horizon, I'm pointing at the screen, you can't see me, but I'm pointing at the screen. But you can see um, the purple board. Now that's your focus plane. Now, wherever that touches is what is going to be in focus for your shot. So if I bring that forward, quite a lot because it's quite a far distance shot as far as the camera's concerned see now as you can see as the camera as the focus plane is on the gunship now the gunship's coming back into focus if i move it even for more forward and so it's touching the clone trooper like that doesn't have to be perfect but it's pretty much there so now the gunship's a bit more in is still in focus but if i turn my aperture down it then gets the depth of field back now, this isn't completely accurate, and you'll see what I mean when we get into actual rendering of the scene. So, I'm going to keep this at 2. Now, it still does look blurry, but we'll get to that in a second. That's how you set up the camera to make it actually look like it's in focus. Second thing I want, the next thing I want to do, should I say, is change the film back width and height. Now, at the moment, it sets a 16 by 9 which is your average 1080p, 720p, 4K, that would be fine if you're doing a 1080p whatever you you want. So let's you're doing a video, you want to upload it in 1080p, or you want to upload it in actual 4K, so 3840 by 2160, what have you. Now I don't like that for cinematics. Now if you look at cinematics um, in movies, you'll see they've always got the two bars at the top and the bottom, and what that is is essentially a 21 by 9 ratio to film, and it's more for like i think it looks cool on like i've got a 16 by 9 monitor in front of me and i just think it looks cinematic anyway just having the top bars at the top and bottom anyway but it's mainly for people who have got i think if they've got a 20 by 1 by 9 monitor it actually looks really good on a on one of those big like long narrow monitors so that's mainly the reason i don't know why that's the case because if you go into like cinemas all cinemas are 16 by 9 so i don't know where this actual theory came from but um, but I like that thought, the idea of having the bars on the top and bottom. So I always do it in a 21 by 9 ratio. If you want to do that, you literally change it. So the width I change to 21 and the height I change to 9. And that literally just does that. You can see the actual format of the box in itself. Now, what I also just need to do because of that is I need to just move the camera back. What you can actually do also, um, if you click the camera so it's actually like within it fills the screen and fills your viewport you can actually use your um right click and your wasd um to actually move the camera around like you would do like a video game so that's also pretty pretty nifty as well and you can also see like the depth of field there is again this is my mouse sensitivity is up the whack anyway but if i just turn my sensitivity down a little bit there we go so that's now in focus and i can change my focus plane again because obviously i moved the camera back a bit so I need to move the focus plane so it's back focusing on the clone like that. Now, I can also, now you can see the actual depth of field is actually shown really quite strongly in on the gunship. Again, I'm going to change that up to 2.3 just to give it, because the thing is, is that like if it's too blurry in the background, it looks really off. Like you don't want the depth of field to be so strong that you can't see what's going on. And this is where trial and error comes about. 
it's good enough me showing you what I'm doing on my screen at the moment. It, every single scene is different. Every lighting source, every environment, every single save that you do in Unreal Engine is going to be done differently. Nothing is... Uh, the main basis of actually like, set up camera settings and what I'm actually showing you what to do is the same. But the values that you use between your different saves can be completely different from, from the start to the finish and from one scene to another scene. Like... All of my Unreal Engine projects that I've got for Traitor at the moment, aside from obviously the 21 by 9 ratio and the um, focal length and things like that, apart from those basic settings which stay the same anyway, I don't think any of my cameras have got the same settings. They're all different because they're all from different angles. They all do different things. They all move slightly differently. Some of them got a bit of a shake. Some of them don't. So they're all different. It just depends on the scene that you're trying to create. This one's all right because this is just a static um standing still animation but if you're trying to like you know pan in animations where you're panning in environments then you probably need to add a bit of camera shake into that and things like that so that's pretty much the camera sorted out more or less the only thing you can also do you can scroll down and tweak a couple settings before you can tweak your post processes and things like that but personally i like to do all my post processing inside of premiere so i'm not going to bother with that too much the only other thing you can do um, which I'm actually going to do because I've got the system resources to do it, is enable ray tracing. Now, if you, there's two things you need to check if you want to enable ray tracing. Is First of all, you need to go into your project settings. First of all, you need to make sure that DirectX is set to DX12. Right, and I think that needs, no, don't need to restart. Um, and you also need to go to ray tracing and make sure that's checked. Right, now we'll ask you for a restart. Um, but once you've done it, it'll enable ray trace trail. I think I disabled it with this original project for some reason or what or another. I don't know. But that's so that's the two things you need to make sure that you do, otherwise it won't show up in your viewport. So I'm gonna restart my own engine project. I'll be back once it's done. Alright guys, so we're back. Um I've reloaded the reloaded the save with ray tracing on. That took way longer than it should have done. Um but so when you restart, it will take a while to load up because it's essentially got to recompile all the textures and shaders for ray tracing. Um, like I had like 30,000 shaders that had and textures that had to be compiled and that takes a long time. And even I've got quite a good PC. So do be prepared to wait if you want to use ray tracing. But once you do it once, you don't have to do it again for the entire save. Um, but also... Don't be concerned if Unreal Engine crashes a couple of times while doing ray tracing because especially if you've got a lower end PC, even if you've got the most high tech PC that you possibly have, it will probably crash at some stage because Unreal Engine is just, that's just what it does. It's a pain in the backside. But anyway, you may not notice much change here. I did an interior environment for Trader like a little while ago. I put ray tracing on and the difference between ray tracing and not ray tracing wasn't that great. Well, I say it wasn't that great. There wasn't much difference between turning it on and turning it off. But I have it on anyway as default because I want to have... I don't want to have to remind myself to turn it off or turn it on. In an outside environment where you've got a lot of dynamic lighting and things like that, you do tend to notice it more. But don't prey on the on the fact that it's going. you're going to see, like, amazing... It's going to go from, like, an average scene to a triple A scene just by turning ray tracing on. It doesn't work like that. It just affects the way shadows work, makes shadows look a little bit nicer. And it does overall affect your scene, but don't expect it for every single scene to make it look like it's been taken out of a live action camera or out of a triple A game studio or something. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna check all of these boxes. You don't need to edit all of them, but I'm just gonna check them all just to show you what, what I would do for each of each of them anyway. So keep ambient occlusion ray tracing ambient occlusion enabled now for everything that's a value except for the roughness ones i always do it to like a plus four so samples per pixel i do four max bounce i do four samples per pixel i do eight ray tracing i keep max roughness i keep at 0.6 max bounce is four samples per pixel four um shadows i do area shadows Include translucency, I click check. It doesn't really do huge amounts, but you can see it sort of affects the light a little bit in the background. Um, okay, keep roughness normal. Max refractions I put to six. Pixels per pi samples per pixel, four. Again, hard shadows, change that to area shadows. Now, in the scene, it doesn't look like it's done a lot. And for a really close-up scene like this, it probably doesn't. But if you get, like, 
So on when Tracer released, I've got some really big scenes and some really big Geonosis environments. And with ray tracing in those, the difference between the two is really, really good because it's a wide open environment. And if I did a pan over the environment here, you could probably see, especially if I didn't was doing, doing a nighttime scene, I was doing a daytime scene, and I panned over, you could probably see the difference between the two. But even though you can see difference, it's not a huge difference. It just makes the shadows in that look a bit nicer. And also, this is just bear in mind, this is only a viewport. Like when it comes to actually rendering it, it's going to look even better. So, now that we've got the camera set up, what we need to do is we need to add our character to our um, scene. It's literally just the same way you did the camera. So, track, add action sequencer, character. Then you should have the animation tab. If you don't have an animation tab, just click track and click animation. And you should be able to search for the animation and put the animation track in. But it should have the animation track already there. If it doesn't, make sure that the character that you've got in the scene is a skeletal mesh. If it's a static mesh, it will not do anything. It will not have an animation tab because it's got no skeleton attached to it. That's how. That's the only thing I can think of if it doesn't work is that it's a static mesh, not a skeletal mesh. So go to animation, click the animation button. YouTube mocap animation, that's what I named it. And there you go, it'll start playing as we recorded it. Right now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move him just to um, the side here. Just a little bit, just to center him back a little bit. Like that. Go back into my camera just make sure my focus plane is where it should be yes it is right now for this that's literally all we're going to do well what I, actually what i will do so that's the sort of um, i'm going to extend this to let's say 200 because there's not huge amounts of frames in it um there we go so stop it at that and go like this so this one here so this is where so if your scene hasn't got this in it just delete it just right so if it looks like this Click the plus camera and click new binding cinema camera actor one or whatever it should be. Now the actual box itself will start from wherever your marker is. So uh, you saw there I made a bit of a mistake by keeping my marker over the top. The box side after the marker. If it does that just drag it and dra drag it over to here. It should ha If you've got this magnet um, thing selected it will snap towards the start and the end points. Drag it from the edge all the way up to the edge and it should snap to, like, to the um, red marker at the end. The next thing. So that's pretty much all we've got to do in here pretty much what you can do if you want to is you can um well actually i'll do it just to show you what i i can what how to do it so if you want to add a bit of movement to the camera you can do it just by keyframing it so you get the transform tool now what i also just want to do quickly is i want to move this forward a bit because obviously there's a few duff frames here that i didn't um didn't get rid of in blender just because it's easier to get rid of it in premiere pro so start it away actually want the animation to start and you know simple as that so what you can do is if you select your camera, you click the transform button. If you want to move it, move it to wherever you want. Again, you can move the keyframes afterwards. But if I move the camera across and then swivel it like... Oh, I've got, hang on, I've got a snap on. Turn that off. And then move it to like there. And then keyframe that again. What that then does is that then... So the clone trooper is then set. It's sort of like it's moving around the clone. So instead of it, so if I just moved it um, without any rotation, it would move and the clone would be in a different position. But because I've moved it and then recentered the rotation so that the clone is in the center, it then rotates around the clone instead of to the side of it, which I think is a really cool effect personally. Um, and then what you can do, you can go forward a bit more. I can move this across a little bit so it's off centered. So again, like let's say if I just do that, you can see it literally just moves the camera to the side instead of panning around again it depends on what you want your camera to look like if you want it to be moved to the side then do it that way but if a standing still shot i prefer it like this and then what you can do if you want to make it go slower you can extend your keyframes so they cover a bit more of the shot like that and then as you can see when you play it it works but it goes slowly if you don't still don't like it extend your keyframes a little bit more i'm going to leave it like this just so it's it's so just so it's gradual but it's not too fast it's not too slow right so that's how you do a bit of keyframe animation on the camera to make it make the camera move. Now, if you wanted to add a camera shake, um, what you need to do is you need to go. I'm getting really like this is I, I know this is a lot to take in. I'm going to try and concise the video down as much as I can in editing. But there's so much with this rendering thing. You know, I'm learning on a day to day basis. It's new stuff that we that you can do inside of Unreal Engine that just make your captures look so much more cinematic and so much better. And it just takes a long time to cram it into one video. 
Um, so if you want to make a, add a camera shake, go to blueprint class, click all all classes, type in shake. Now you can do um, camera shake. I think it's this one. I'm pretty sure. Now bear in mind, I am using um, I think it's 4.25. I have been using 4.26 before. I've been using 4.26 before when with traitor stuff and this, but it basically works the same way. What you can do is, if, so if you set your oscillation duration to zero, that will mean that you can extend it to the entire shot if you want to. Um, and you don't, it's not actually, if it's set to like one, it'd be for like one second, then you've got duplicated. If it's set to zero, you can extend it out the entire sequence without any restrictions at all. All right, so I think I've got it. Now, I'll just be, just a bit of advanced warning just before I do this. It will make you feel a little bit, it might make you feel a little bit motion sick, but this is basically what the camera shake does, right? Now, I have set the duration to three because for some reason if i set it to zero it doesn't do it it won't do anything so if i set it so maybe you need actually need to in 4.25 you actually do need to set it for as long as you actually want it um i just know if i'm using it 4.26 um and i want to set the duration for infinite it will just if i click do it on zero it will um it'll do it like infinitely so just be aware of that but as you can see, this is a little bit too much. Obviously, way, way too much. Um, it does make me feel a little bit, um, a little bit sick. So what I need, so I'm going to do, I'm going to set it to two, set this to 0.5, set this to 0.5 as well, and go. Let's go two and 0.5 across the board. And again, this is the sort of thing I mean with Unreal Engine. It's sort of like you do it to how you think it's going to work for your scene. Again, even that is a bit too much. So I'm going to set that to one, set that to one set this to one as well then click compile is that gonna work still quite a lot of range so i'm going to go 0 0.1 0 0.1 0 0.1 click compile try this again okay that looks all right it's a little bit bouncy what i'm gonna do i'm gonna set that to, set it to two go two two and two Hit compile and that should yeah see that doesn't doesn't look doesn't look awful it's again it's a little still a little bit much so if i just if i set this to um 30 seconds just for the sake of the fact that i know this is how long this is going to don't to last for so if i go like that again it's still a bit much but you can try and error it yourself depending on how you how you want it again for the purposes of this video i'm going to leave it at that right just to save me wasting any more time faffing about with settings so the next thing is rendering right now there's two ways of doing this there's the easy way but you get less quality or there's a the hard way and you get lots of quality right now the easy way of doing this is using the sequencer renderer right now this is the easy way because all you've got to do is set a few checkboxes Say compression quality and click capture movie and it'll do it like that. Right, simple as that. No questions asked, easy as what have you, right? This is where it gets a bit complex. Now, for some reason, I think you've got to set... If I set it as um, 1080p, that should hopefully capture it in a 1080, in within what the actual screen is showing me, I think. Again, I haven't used this in ages, but I'll just show you how, how it works. So... I always go, you've got your different render formats. Now, you can use AVI. Now, whichever one you use, you're going to have to render it in Premiere Pro first. Because AVI, if you try and work in Premiere Pro with AVI files, you're not going to get anywhere because it's slow as hell. These files are huge. I'm not saying that the, the um, image sequences are not big as well, but like image sequences, you have to you have to render in Premiere Pro anyway to turn them into a video format anyway. AVI videos, if you render it, you put it into Premiere Pro, it's just going to lag and it's not going to work. You've got to render it again into an MP4 anyway. So people turn around and say, and I used to do this as well, I think, oh, AVI, you go straight into a video format, so that's easy. Not necessarily, it just depends. Like Again, if you want to go AVI, by all means, but I always use BMP because it's quite high quality and I'm going to have to render it anyway, so I may as well do it in an image sequence. Something that you've got to work, got to look at is now this is already saved to video cap the video capture folder within my um actual project save make sure it's in a folder because if you save it to your desktop 
your desktop is going to be messed. And if you then run out of space in your desktop, because it's all been taken up by pictures of this image sequence, and, you know, we're working at like 170 frames here, 176 frames, 176 picture files. If you just put it on your desktop, you're going to run out of space, you're just going to crash because it can't find anywhere else to put these images. So make sure it's in a folder. Right, I made that mistake a couple of times before because I like to save things on my desktop because if I do like thumbnail renders, I just chuck them straight onto my desktop. Um, I've made that mistake a couple of times. It's not fun. Learn from my mistakes. Don't do it. So, and it is literally, so your frame rate is already checked. If it's not quite right, just choose a drop down, choose whatever frame rate you want. Use separate process. I always keep this one checked if I'm going to be using movie ren um, this render this sequence renderer. Um, I just think it just brings out better quality and also it uses a set so you can still work inside of Unreal Engine Whilst the render is going on although I don't recommend that but you can and I also just think it work it, I can just like keep it organized and it I don't know that's just my personal like preference Change it change the name don't change the frame because that's gonna mess it up change the world because That's the actual name of the file keep it the same if you want to by all means But I'm not gonna render this you just click capture movie when you finish and it'll start rendering I'm not going to bother with that because I want to show you how Movie Render Queue works because Movie Render Queue is better and I personally, if you're going to render something, I highly advise you use Movie Render Queue because the quality difference is night and day. I always used to do Sequence, ed, sequence Renderer. The difference is mind-boggling what the difference in, um, in quality is between it. So how you get to your Movie Render Queue thing is you go Cinematics, Movie Render Queue, Open it up. You can have it in a separate window. You can chuck it down here if you want to. I'm going to, if I can. No, no, no I can chuck it down there. I can't chuck it down there. That's fine. So click render. Make sure um, you select the level sequence that's yours. So YouTube animation is the one that I want. Um, click settings. If you've got a preset, that's fine. If you don't, then I'm going to show you how to make one. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to get rid of JPEG sequence. Go into settings. Click BMP sequence. That's the one that I want to use. Come back out, choose anti aliasing, change the temporal sample amount to 32. If you're outside, it shouldn't really go above 32. If you're so essentially, what, what this is is for every single frame that um, your the movie render queue renders, it does a 32 pass, if that makes sense. So you'll see what I mean when we actually get into rendering it. Um, so, set to 32, that 32 is fine for outside environments. If you're going to go inside, your inside environments, maybe change it up to about 45, 50. But again, just bear in mind that if you've got a sequence with big, like, meta humans, lots of lighting, ray tracing, everything, the more passes it's got to do on that particular frame, the longer it's going to take and the longer your render is going to take. It proves that better quality, but you've just got, but it's going to take longer. That's just part and parcel of um, what you do. So, Click over on anti aliasing. Don't do anything else. Just click that checkbox and leave it at that. Um, one other thing, I think there's console variables is the only other one that I do. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut ahead in the video to me filling out these um, these things because I've actually got to go and find out find the website where I've got to where I find the console variables, and it's going to take me a while because I don't actually know where they are. So. I'll be back once I filled them out, and then I'll show you on screen um, what the different console variables are in the document. So I'll be back in a second. All right, so I'm back, and I've got the console variables in. You can't really see them that well, but I'll post a video on the uh, sorry, an image on the side of the screen with um, the different console variables. You don't need the only thing that's on there is you don't need the number. So on the end, it's got a zero on each of the different console variables. That zero represents what's in here, this side bit here. So you don't need, any, just copy the text. So as you can see here, I haven't got any text. I've all got text. There's no numbers or anything. The number zero represents this number on the side. So you don't need to bother about any of that, right? So that's all that you need for rent, for movie render queue. It's not as complicated as I thought, it, as I remember setting it up to be, but that's just, it's just a bit of a, like, it's quite complicated. So here, this is where I can change my... Um, sequence manually now think about it now this is what I needed to do with the movie with a sequence of renderer so I think my resolution was supposed should be 3840 I think it's 1574 I think it's something like that and that's about the 21 by 9 ratio again if you go if you google what a 21 by 9 um, resolution is it'll tell you it's something like 1574 
by 38 40 by 50 and 74 it's about 21 by 9 it's not perfect but it's only a couple frames off so pixels off so really it doesn't make huge amounts of difference um again custom frame rate you can choose that if you want to um if you want to change it from whatever it is and it's not correct and that's pretty much it so you click accept if you want to turn this into a saved config presets save as preset um I'm just go into my content i'm just going to change it m r um, Q, uh, MRQ. Simple as that. Presets is right there. You can go in, in all your settings already there. Right. So click accept. Oh, what I also didn't do is I didn't change the um, directory. So this is a folder on my desktop, which has got nothing really majorly in it. Um, apart from a few thumbnails and before, but that's fine. So click accept. You need to click render local and it will start rendering. Now, you can see. You can see, just wait for it to kick up a minute and I'll show you what I mean when I say about the, um, and the alias and subsampling. So what it'll do is it'll do a, um, so here you go, so you've got subsample tool. So for every single frame, it's got 169 frames, for every single frame it's doing a subsample of 32. So for every single frame it's counting up by 32. Now, again, for outside lighting it's not that much of an issue. Now it's not going to take an hour, I certainly hope it's not going to take an hour anyway. Um, now, for outside lighting, 32 is pretty much all you're going to need. If you're doing like an interior scene, maybe bump up to 45, 50. Again, I've not really ever, I've gone up to 40, like 38, 40 with an interior scene before. And I think that's all sort of the best that I've ever gotten. Um, as far as like it going any further, increasing quality and whatnot. So do it as you want to do it i'm not you know, that's again a lot of this is up to your personal interpretation but the reason why this has taken so long is i've got a camera shake i've got animation i've got high quality rendering we've got 32 subsample we've got ray tracing and all that so it is going to take a while so again like i said if we did this in the sequence of renderer this would not take no time at all this would be done within about 10 minutes but because of because we're doing this so in depthly and movie render queue, the quality difference is night and day. But it does take a while, so be prepared to wait. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut ahead in the video. Actually, what I'm going to do I'm going to end the video here because from next video we're going to be in Premiere Pro about rendering. So I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Again, I'm sorry it's been a really long video. Like I've been recording for about hours. This video's not going to be an hour long because there's a lot of stuff I have cut out. But um. There's just so much, like, I'm still learning things. And, you know, shout out hugely to William Fortune because his videos, I wouldn't have known about Movie Render Queue if it wasn't for him, or Camera Shake, or how to turn on ray tracing, or anything, if it wasn't for him. So a lot of what I learn is from his um, channel. It's amazing. If you have any questions about Unreal Engine and want to see some tutorials about how the different, um, like, lighting things and that work in proper detail, go and check him out because I tell you what, he's amazing. Um, but I'm learning things every day about Unreal Engine and how to make my renders better. And I tell you what, just like, it's so much to pack into one video. It just takes forever. But I do hope that I haven't rambled on for too long. Again, when I come into editing, I will take out all my little bits that I don't really think like require a video per se and part, be part of the video. So anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you do have any questions for me about what I've done in this video or anything I've done in the previous videos, um, leave it in the comment section down below. Again, I'll try my best to answer them in either in the comment section or I will do a separate video on them. Um, but apart from that, that's about all I have time for this video. I shall see you all later. Bye!